Hi, everyone. This is a Room Now podcast. Today is January 6, 2023, and this is the 2023 Rheumatology Year in Review. In this podcast, I'm going to review what I thought were my top 10 list of new advances, game changers, and what I think are best medical practices gleaned from the last 12 months. Was it an interesting year, was it not? I think that you know we dealt with change and getting back to normal, uh, but again, rheumatologists were resilient and really respected and leaders in the way that only you can be. I think that um, while a lot happened in 2022, did your life change very much? Are you that different? I think most of you'd say it didn't change that much. I mean, are you... Are you still doing telemedicine? Are you still doing Zoom meetings? Are you wedded to these new guidelines? Um, I think for many, the big event in 2023 was getting on a plane and going to a big meeting that you like and seeing the people you like and hearing the lectures the way you want to hear them. That was kind of new, but still the thing you expect and therefore was quite refreshing. But yet, even though not too much changed in 2022, um, science did uh, and medicine did move forward considerably. And that's kind of what uh, my take is all about. So here's my top 10 list. Number one, I always begin, and this is in no particular order of importance, but number one is uh, what happened at the FDA and with new drugs, because we always point to new drugs. The FDA is always important in what we do. But in 2022, they almost hit a record low in drug approvals. These would be novel um, um, drugs, new medical entities. Um, they only approved 37. In the last few years, they're kind of doing 45 to 50 a year. So this number is down, not a lot, but it still is um, a, another low that kind of wasn't expected for this year. Um, and maybe more importantly, <laughs> there were no new drugs in rheumatology. Um, that's kind of disappointing for us. There were two new drugs in dermatology that may have later importance in rheumatology. That was ducravacitinib or so TIC2, the TIC2 inhibitor for plaque psoriasis, and uh, spezolimab or Spavigo, an IL-36 monoclonal antibody um, that is used for flares of pustular psoriasis. But what did happen was that there were a number of new indications on top of old drugs. So, for instance, there was a new line item in the Peglodicase package insert that now says you can use Cristexa with um, methotrexate, and that's probably the advisable way to go to limit some of the side effects and increase the efficacy and durability of the drug. Um, Ustekinumab was approved for use in pediatric psoriatic arthritis. Belimumab was approved in pediatric lupus nephritis. Rizinkizumab, the IL-23 inhibitor, was approved for both psoriatic arthritis and adults with uncontrolled Crohn's disease. Upadacitinib, another JAK inhibitor, was approved for spondyloarthritis and non-radiographic spondyloarthritis. Baricitinib was approved for alopecia areata. That was a big advance. You know, there's a lot of research going on in people who have alopecia universalis and bad alopecia areata. The JAK inhibitors are in trials. Baricitinib's first to get to approval. Also, baricitinib was FDA approved for use in hospitalized COVID patients on oxygen, steroids, and not doing all that well, needing, also needing mechanical support. Same thing for tocilizumab. Uh, it was approved for use in COVID-19 patients who are hospitalized with those same parameters, basically severely um, serious uh, COVID-19. And then uh, a new EUA, or emergency use authorization for COVID, was issued for anakinra in hospitalized patients. Um, the other big news at the FDA this year was sort of the holdup on bimikizumab, the dual IL-17A slash F inhibitor. Uh, it was put onto hold when they received the complete response letter. I think it was back in March, which was really had to do with uh, not the efficacy or safety of the drug, but had to do with the manufacture of the drug. Those issues, I believe, have been resolved, and those uh, the regulatory process is uh, 
in process. Maybe bimikizumab will be approved in 2023 for use in psoriasis first, and then later in psoriatic arthritis if we're lucky. That probably won't be to 2024, would be my guess at this point. And that's a guess because I'm good at guessing. I like to guess. We call it a guesstimate. Um, number two on my list are advances in lupus. This is always of great importance to us. We've seen a lot of advances in lupus with a lot of new drugs in the last few years. Um, some drugs actually not even do well in the last few years. But the things that really caught our attention was uh, Georg Schett's study on CAR T-cell therapy in refractory SLE patients. Five patients all failed everything, doing horribly, stopped their DMARDs, stopped their steroids, gave them CAR T-cell, and they all went into remission. They all went from sleet eyes from, of like 10, 12, 8, down to zero. Really dramatic. It's incredibly expensive. Uh, its future utility is unknown, but we need to see more dramatic efficacy like this. Um, so congratulations to Dr. Shet. Ducravacitinib uh, got highlighted, I think, at, at ULAR and ACR with the Paisley study, a phase two trial showing that TIC2 inhibition was effective in patients with lupus. Um, they're now going to go into phase three. We'll see where they, do, we, where they go. We do know that in phase three, a lot of lupus drugs drop out. That happened to baricitinib this year and, and ustekinumab, I think, at the between 21 and 2022. Uh, those drugs look good in phase two, but crashed and burned in phase three. But ducravacitinib right now is marching ahead. That might be cool uh, for the future. And there were some experimental drugs that really got attention and again these are phase one phase two but i think they're worth noting and that is a btk inhibitor called um or oralabrutinib it's one of those brutinibs oralabrutinib and then there's a um, monoclonal antibody against bdca2 a receptor on plasma cytoid dendritic cells it's called biibo59 and someday we'll get a new name uh, we'll see Maybe there's going to be a future for those two drugs. Number three on my list is dermatology, uh, new drugs and indications. While what happens in rheumatology often seems to have play and carry over into dermatology, and sometimes it's the exact opposite, now this year it looks like dermatology had all the good favor on new drugs. So a lot of new drug approvals and indications in the dermatology world. That included baricitinib for alopecia areata as we talked about. That included uh, ducravacitinib for plaque psoriasis and spezolizumab, spezolimab for pustular psoriasis. Um, the hot new area, as you know, is eczema or atopic dermatitis, where upadacitinib was approved. Um, Pfizer has another one called um, uh, abrocitinib. These were uh, oral. These are oral agents that are approved for uh, topical eczema. There's a lot of drugs for eczema. There's actually a topical ruxolitinib um, that's also out there. Um, there are also other new drugs like a PD4 inhibitor cream called uh, crisoboral. Um, it's also called Eucrisa, and I certainly know about the ad advertisements for um, dupilumab or dupex, dupexin, an IL-4, IL-13 inhibitor that seems to work really well in atopic dermatitis. And lastly, there's a little buzz in going on in hydra uh, still in hydradenitis suppurativa. While there was no approvals, um, there's a lot of positive data coming down the line with IL-17 inhibitors, good studies in secukinumab and bimikizumab. In patients who have hydradenitis suppurativa, I've done that in my patients and work, seen it work. As you know, the only dr drug that we use that works there uh, is uh, Humira or Adalimumab. Number four on my list are the new guidelines. There's a bunch of them. There's uh, probably about 20 of them that I could have listed in um, my uh, 2023 year in review that I published yesterday. But uh, I'll highlight four of them for you. Um, again, do you pay attention to guidelines or are they like... Traffic lights in New York City where it's just a suggestion and you can blow through it or not. Um, if you don't know what that's like, rent a car and try to drive in Manhattan. You're in for an experience. It's lawlessness on the road in Manhattan. Uh, and red lights are, again, like guidelines. So here's our guidelines. I like um, most of all the GRAPA guidelines. They are labeled as 2021, but they came out in Nature um, in 2022, and it's a great guideline. You should print out the table that shows you the hierarchy of use, and they, 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 I love the way they do it. 
They separate it out by domains, whether you have polyarthritis, oligoarthritis, enthesitis, skin disease only, uveitis even. Um, it's just brilliant the way they do it. Um, num number two on my list is the ULAR recommendations for the management of rheumatoid arthritis. This is a 2022 document that was featured at ULAR by Dr. Joseph Smolin. It's a good document. I like it more so than the ACR guidelines. I think it's more practical. Um, they're a little more liberal in the use of steroids. Um, I think it's worth having as a reference. Uh, next would be the ACR guidelines on um, the prevention of glucocorticoid osteoporosis. Rheumatologists love these guidelines and love the topic of osteoporosis. It's good to review. And lastly, the 2021 um, guidelines on the treatment of systemic JIA that was published in 2022. This is important because it says, first line, you can use a biologic, meaning an IL-1 or an IL-6 inhibitor in patients with Stills disease. All right, next, number five on my list is invasion of the biosimilars you know it's we're getting ready for 2023 2023 is going to be a bit of a breakout year in biosimilars largely because patents are going to soon be lost for adalimumab and also for um um etanercept but especially adalimumab there's eight new by uh, adalimumab biosimilars in waiting that will go into play one early in 2023. Most of those are going to happen in the second half of 2023. Those are negotiated agreements between um, AbbVie and the makers of those biosimilars. There were two new ones approved, two new adalimumab biosimilars that were approved this year. Uh, Idacio, I-D-A-C-I-O, that's adalimumab A-A-C-F, uh, you and European are la in Europe are, la are laughing at us with our suffixes after the generic names. And uh, Usimri is another one, Adalimumab AQVH. Um, that was approved in late 21. I included it in this list. But now, again, rheumatology sort of dominates the biosimilar space. There's 40 biosimilars currently approved in the United States, and they're really only, I think, in the in the um, cancer space and the rheumatology space. We um, garner 17 of those approvals. So as I said earlier, we have eight adalimumab biosimilars. Nice. We have four infliximab biosimilars. They've already been in play. We have two etanercept biosimilars and three rituximab. Most of these are going to be in play in 2023. Sadly, in the United States, that amounts to about a 10 to 30% reduction in the cost. However, in Europe, it often results in a 70% reduction in the cost. We need to be more like Europe and uh, less like what we're negotiating here. But these changes are going to happen and you need to be on board and understand these because it's going to affect your patients. Number six, um, JAMA had this article from the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force about the recommendation that um, multivitamins and supplements be used to reduce the risk of cardiovascular outcomes and cancer. Their review now says, sorry, Charlie, there is no, or they said there's insufficient evidence to support the use of multivitamins to prevent cardiovascular disease or cancer. And that in fact, there's probably more evidence in favor of toxicity than there is for efficacy. Boy, that really changes the game. Now, I don't see much toxicity, honestly. Um, with, and in fact, I see almost no toxicity. I, well, let's, let me clarify further. I've seen no toxicity due to vitamin use in uh, any of my patients, assuming that it's being used, like it says, per label and not in a crazy way. Um, so I'll still advocate for multivitamins, even though this JAMA article suggests it is of, of no value. Certainly the um, uh, USPSTF uh, task force continue to recommend diet and exercise as preventative measures. Next, seven, where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? I mean, where have you gone telemedicine? This is a call out to rheumatologists. We all use telemedicine or most of us, the majority of rheumatologists were engaged in telemedicine by April of 2020. And now all of you have abandoned it or you're doing almost none of it. Or there's a minority of you who are doing it 20 to 30% of the time. 
I think this is a tremendous advance in the practice of rheumatology and to advance it, to abandon it is to basically reclaim your old Neanderthal ways of practicing rheumatology. This is the future. You know, digital medicine, digital education, ways of communicating with patients that are uh, an advantage for patients and an advantage for you, you should be adopting. In the early days, it was psychiatry leading the way in telemedicine, and rheumatology was either second or third amongst all the disciplines. And why? You're suited for telemedicine because we are a cognitive discipline. We are non-procedural. We are rooted in pattern recognition, safety monitoring, and patient-reported outcomes. This is so much of what you do face-to-face. Why not do it virtually for patients as follow-up visits and interim visits? It especially makes sense in the care of chronic conditions of which is the majority of your care. Please get back into it. That's my advice. Number eight, safety issues. There were but a few, and that's sort of good news. The FDA sort of reviewed this at the ACR FDA um, safety session. Uh, two that I'll hi- highlight for you is the nosumab, and uh, we received a safety warning that there is a potential risk for severe hypocalcemia in dialysis patients taking denosumab. And the FDA is investigating this. They continue to recommend that uh, your patients be on, have their calcium levels checked, that they continue calcium and vitamin D, uh, and further um, um, information is going to come from the FDA this year, I would assume. Also, the package change, uh, package insert change with, as a result of the mirror study showing the efficacy and safety of methotrexate when given with peglodicase. Again, the great thing about that is infusion reactions with peglodicase alone is like 31%, but on methotrexate, it's only 4%. I mean, it's, I think you should be using it. Next, nine, we're getting towards the end. GCA uh, and PMR are on the horizon for new approved therapies, especially PMR. So 2022 saw a number of trials published about the efficacy of IL-6 inhibitors in patients with refractory um, steroid non-responsive polymyalgia rheumatica. That includes the Sapphire study with cerilumab, and there are two studies with tocilizumab, the PMR SPARE study, and the Semaphore study, I think it was a French study, um, basically showed really good efficacy when these IL-6 inhibitors were used after failing steroids. I, I would assume that the way this is going, that 2023 may lead to some of those being drug approvals. Again, there's a lot of action going on in GCA. We know about tocilizumab and GACTA. We know about last year, the Titan study, the IL-17 inhibitor being used also in GCA patients. So there's a lot of action going on in this, this, in this area that is going to clinically impact patients in 2023. And lastly, um, waiting for a good dough, no, waiting for RA meaning preclinical RA continues to be an active area of research and investigation and I think advances. Um, Interestingly, over the years, this has evolved under multiple names, including uh, differentiated arthritis, clinically suspect arthralgia, preclinical RA, sort of unified by being seropositive, often with first-degree relatives, having arthralgias, no synovitis, and maybe some other finding like inflammation as measured by an imaging or by a CRP. But a few things are going on here. The clinical trials, the ARIA study had its third um, introduction at ACR22. ARIA is an 18-month trial where patients who are CCV positive with arthralgia get six months of abatacept or placebo and then follow 12 months on placebo. And again, after all the analyses, it still looks to be preventative. Some don't like it when I say that. Again, developing future RA was 35% on placebo, only, I'm uh, sorry, 35% on abatacep and 57% on placebo. The lines didn't meet, but in the least you can say it slowed the development of the disease. There was also improvements in MRI and a number of other parameters. Uh, the STOP RA was the negative study that came out in 2022. STOP RA was a hydroxychloroquine versus placebo intervention in an intervention trial in 144 patients 
who had CCP and arthralgias, but no inflammatory arthritis. This, drug, this study was stopped for futility by not being able to show any benefit of hydroxychloroquine. And that's sad because any of you who've dealt with preclinical RA, the family member or someone who has RA and they have an arthralgist and you're worried, you see, you give them your, your safest drug and that's hydroxychloroquine. Well, that didn't seem to work based on the STOP RA trial. There's a lot of good research going on, a lot of it coming from the University of Colorado. That's Mike Holler, Kevin Dean, um, uh, and other researchers there doing great work. There's a, they had um, a great abstract at ACR showing that if you took CCP positive individuals and collected spit on them, you could find sputum CCP antibodies in some of those patients. And those were the ones with a greater risk of developing future RA, a fourfold greater risk of developing future RA. That's kind of cool. And, and another one is the uh, identifying the um, uh, a new gut mycobacterium. So I don't want to. You're going to have to look it up in the article. It's subdoligranulum, subdoligranulum, DDO legisi. You know, these are the species names of this this particular bug. But anyway, um, uh, that particular. Um, bacterium had an increased risk of association with future RA development. Um, and I think that it, it sort of ties in well with what University of Colorado researchers have put together as the mucosal origins hypothesis that it is um, the microbiome and the mucosal invasion of certain bugs that can lead to an autoimmune state and then ultimately later the development of RA or, or even better, the mucosal attack of bugs with an autoimmune state leads to development. So I think that's all really interesting and cool. I'm going to end with um, a number of unfortunate passings of great rheumatologists. You can look at today's In Memoriam article and see the whole list. There's like 50 or so. And I'm, my apologies to any room, uh, anybody I left off the list. I did spend a few days trying to find the obituaries on some of these individuals. But a lot of these were giants in my world and friends of mine. Martin Litsky from the Houston VA Medical Center, a fabulous rheumatologist. Bart Lindsley, who worked at Southwestern for a while and was a staple at UKMC. Um, Tom Thomas from the Vanderbilt program in Nashville. Eric Gall, oh my God, what a great rheumatologist. Started in Chicago, ended at University of Arizona, was famous for so many things, including his patient educator program. William Wilkie, who was a leader in so many areas, not just fibromyalgia, but even RA therapeutics. John Winfield, a great researcher and lupologist from, um, from Virginia and North Carolina. Peter Simpkin, oh my goodness, University of Washington, like worldwide leader in gout and so many other things. Uh, three giants from Stanford. Stanford took a big blow this year. Um, James Fries, a good friend. Um, Hugh McDivitt, Samuel Strober, all passed on in 2022. John Condemi from the University of Rochester. Robert Lightfoot. I met Robert Lightfoot when I was a first-year fellow. He was the the chair of the session when I presented an oral presentation at the ACR in 1984, and he was so kind and nice to me. And thereafter, a friend and a great, you know, rheumatologist and leader um, served the ACR in many ways. Bernard Germain from Florida and Dennis Ford from Canada. These are all big names that were lost this year. And then this early in January, um, the unfortunate loss of uh, Dr. Philip Robinson, a great friend and rheumatologist uh, from Brisbane, Australia. Philip, as you know, is the guy who started the Global Rheumatology Alliance, but so many of them know him as a very cool dude, a wonderful friend, a guy that made you laugh. Um, he was wicked smart. He was a go-getter. He got things done. He was a gout expert. You know, he influenced many. He was taught by many. Um, he suddenly died in early January, and uh, we're going to miss him greatly. Um, and we'll feature him in the week to come uh, in a tribute. Um, I hope 2023 is going to be a wonderful year for you. Um, thank you so much for following Room Now.